And so, okay. yeah, so I have put the camera here if you want to stand here. That's should I better stand on that side, maybe, or like can you see me now? Yeah, 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 okay. So, welcome. This lecture series is about neutrino astrophysics and astronomy, and I will qualify that, of course, in a minute, a little bit later. Can you hear me, everybody? Is it okay? Yeah. Now, switching the slides again doesn't work because I think. Ah. Sorry, so they, apparently if you are like in Zoom and it, there's a messages, then uh, you have to click it away again. So this is like the plan of my lectures. Lecture one is like an overview. I mean, you know that I'm a theorist, right? So I'm like doing like astroparticle theory, but in this lectures, uh, of course, I also want to talk a little bit about experimental results. So I'm, I'm not really like a super expert on that, but I'm going to try to explain you a bit, you know, like what the most interesting results on astrophysical neutrinos also are. And that's basically part of today's lecture. But I also want to give you a flavor of theory. And in a way, like all these lectures will be a mixture between observation or experiment and theory, okay? So um, I will mix them a little bit uh, like uh, um, more strongly, like tomorrow, for instance. Tomorrow, I want to talk more, more about astrophysical objects. And uh, on Thursday, probably uh, about the ultra high energy cosmic ray connection. So let's see how far we get. So today's plan is more to talk a little bit about the most interesting observations on astrophysical neutrinos and a little bit about the physics on the neutrino production. And I also realized that we will have a lot of like talks on different subjects related to that. And I mark them. I mean, you will find that also uh, in some places like by these yellow markers here, for instance, Annika is talk talking about GRB neutrinos on Wednesday. And we kind of sorted that these talks also like the highlight talks and also the contributed talks like your talks on the subjects are kind of like sorted in a way that they fit also the schedule. So uh, I will talk about very basics and then you can hear more about the details also in the contributed talks. So let's talk about a, a little bit of like introduction. I mean, this is one of uh, the famous plots which shows the diffuse neutrino flux. Uh, here, this is the neutrino number flux, in fact, per square centimeter and second as a function of energy. Now you see different contributions, like you see the cosmic neutrino background, you see the solar geo neutrinos, the diffuse supernova neutrinos, perhaps reactor neutrinos, and so on. At higher energies, you find the atmospheric neutrinos with this kind of decaying spectrum. We will come back to that. And at the highest energies, the um, ice cube or the, the neutrino telescope neutrinos, possibly also even at the, the very highest energies, the cosmogenic neutrinos I'm going to come back to uh, on Thursday. Plus, apart from these diffuse fluxes, we have so-called transient fluxes. I mean, in a way, you can also interpret like beams as uh, transient fluxes because it's like a pulsed flux, and they're only there, the signal, if you switch them on, right? If you have an accelerator neutrino beam, but also like uh, explosions, like a galactic super, supernova, so-called tidal disruption events, AGN flares, I will come back to all of that later, uh, are so-called transients. Now, what do we learn from that? Okay, the most abundant neutrinos are apparently the cosmic uh, neutrino background neutrinos and also solar neutrinos. And you can multiply that easily with the surface area of let's say a human being, if you wanted to know how many neutrinos actually are streaming through you at any given second. I will mostly talk about the very high, highest energetic neutrinos like this part here. So that's different from the most abundant neutrinos. Of course, if you plot this in terms of like the, the energy flux, this will get a little bit more weight. But at the end, I mean, uh, I, I will talk about this end of the spectrum. And I also try to interpret your here, there, and everywhere. I like <laughs> So that here is this part here. So I'm not going to talk about here. So that means I will also not talk about solar neutrinos, even though that's like astrophysical neutrinos. Uh, the everywhere, I'm also not going to talk about. I, if you split it in energy, I will talk about the there part, which is like the highest energetic part, and a little bit about the atmospheric neutrinos. I think you heard something about already this morning. So how does the universe actually look like in multiple messengers? This is like a, a one of the cartoon pictures, which you may have seen before. We know we do have like four different messengers and that's like not only the neutrinos. And if you wanted to interpret neutrino results, it's, you always have to also think about the other like messengers. And the most important one is electromagnetic radiations from like whatever radio energies to very high energy gamma rays. 
So that's like a broad thing. And I will come back to that a little bit in greater detail tomorrow or so, like what kind of like wavelength bands there are and what that means and so on. Uh, we have like neutrinos produced in astrophysical sources, uh, astrophysical sources this electromagnetic radiation, and also uh, the cosmic rays, which are in fact the primaries of the neutrinos, which you see in this kind of cartoon interactions, where a proton interacts with like radiation or like a, a gas, and you will produce like neutral and charged pions, and the charged pions uh, decay in the usual way into muons and muon neutrinos. The muons decay further into electrons, and electron neutrinos and muon neutrinos. Here, the polarities are not attached to the different species, but in principle, you know how it works. The, the pi zeros would mainly, mainly decay into like gamma rays. So that will be interesting later. So this is like it, it, the way like what we have. In addition, there are gravitational waves. The connection between gravitational waves and neutrinos is in principle there in certain models, but it's much more loose. So these there are some results. There are some interesting like uh, 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 um, discussions, but it's not like as strong as between, let's say, the source neutrinos and uh, the um, the cosmic rays, which are the primaries of the neutrinos. These cosmic rays will be deflected by magnetic fields, like extragalactic magnetic fields. So they typically don't point directly back to the source. And while they are propagating through the extragalactic magnetic fields between the source and Earth, they're also interacting with the cosmic microwave background and also other background light. And then that processes that produce um, by the same kind of processes you have in the source, but with these particular targets, uh, so-called cosmogenic neutrinos. So these cosmogenic neutrinos are a topic I want to touch on, upon like on, on Thursday. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about observations. So if you talk about observations, the main experiment, which is delivering data right now, it's not the only one, but the main one is uh, ice cube. That's like a cubic kilometer uh, detector in the Antarctic ice, where you see here the depth uh, in terms of like uh, the surface here. And you have to picture it like as uh, strings, like these here, which are, which are picturized like this here, of like small like units. These units are called digital optical modules. And these digital optical modules are basically photomultipliers together with, together with some readout electronics in kind of like a, a glass shielding, which withstands the high pressure. So like, you know, like you, you shield it from the surrounding ice. So what you would do is you would drill holes in the ice by hot water drilling. So you have like a hot water drill that's just hot water you heat there. You melt a hole, you put in these strings, and then you let it freeze again. So at the end, these detectors will find itself in the ice. Um, what you do then later is if a particle propagates through the ice, it will produce like by some kind of interactions light. So what you detect in these detectors is the light produced by these interactions. And this is something you can see in these illustrations here, where you, for instance, here you have a muon entering the detector, a muon neutrino entering the detector, interacting inside the detector with the ice, would produce like a muon and the muon propagates. And from this propagation by, by all these processes, you would detect the light and the light, the, the number of photons essentially, or the amount of light you detect is to, uh, proportional to the size in, in this picture here of this, uh, like let's say of these um, marbles. And the, the timing is illustrated by the color. So red means early and blue means late, okay? So here you see that you would have like a muon propagating, which has started here probably, and then propagates in that direction, okay? So you can determine something, uh, you can determine the direction very well in this case. You can also say something about, let's say, at least the minimum energy because it may like leave your detector here. So you cannot say anything anymore. It's tip a typical top topology, which is called a muon track, mostly from muon neutrino interactions um, where you get very good directional information on. There are other topologies which are interesting there. One are these so-called cascades or showers from electron or tau neutrino interactions where you would rather see like, let's say contained, uh, a contained event, like an electromagnetic or hadronic shower manifesting itself as like a light essentially showing up as a blob. And you can see that from this kind of like comparison already that here you probably have very good energy information with it because it may be like a contained event. So you can actually capture all of the energy in your detector, but you can hardly see the direction of the, of the particle of the secondary particle. So it's like, 
apparent that in this case you have better energy information and in that case you have better uh, directional information and that's the main topology is how you actually measure like astrophysical neutrinos now there are of course other detectors as well so that's for instance the antares detector which operates in the mediterranean uh, there you won't use like ice you don't want to use ice as a detector material but it's like seawater seawater has a little bit different properties in terms of like scattering and absorption length so these techniques are in a way a little bit complementary as well uh, the main reason why ice cube delivers more data at the moment or better data let's say is because it's larger okay so it's, it's a matter of like volume at the moment you see that the technology is also a bit different. You have also strings again, which are attached to, to the seafloor uh, with boys like swimming up there. Like, uh, uh, and of course these, these strings, they're moving around. So you need a little bit of like extra, let's say technology to, to monitor also the position of these detectors um, and uh, the topology of these, these digital, digital, digital optical modules is also a bit different. There are like different units here, which are, uh, uh, so it, it depends a little bit like how you set up your detector and in what medium, but in principle, there, there are these different techniques. Now, the discovery of the astrophysical neutrinos meant that like a diffuse flux of astrophysical neutrinos was seen. So that's like a little bit older figure from 2017, where you see again, these two topologies I was talking about before, you see the cascades as like these plus signs and the, the time signs here are the muon tracks. So you see like cascade, cascade, they were like muon tracks. And this was uh, like uh, kind of like isotropically distributed over the sky. And a, a signal which is isotrop isotropically distributed over the sky always means it's coming from far, far away. So it's probably of extra galactic origin. There is a little like gap in here, which comes from, uh, from the fact that neutrinos like at very high energies cannot penetrate the earth. So remember that if you're doing the exercises. Um, here in this plane, you also see that this is actually in galactic coordinates. That means the galactic plane is here. We will come back to that a little bit later. With a little bit of imagination, you may also already be able to see here some kind of like galactic signal. So, um, but this is like from 2017, as I said. These purple colors are an attempt to actually look for like clustering for events. But at that time, there was nothing which was like statistically, uh, statistically significant. Uh, that has changed, of course, in the meanwhile. And you can also see, I mean, this is why I find this map very illustrative. Um, there's the Northern Hemisphere. I will come back to that, and I think in one or two slides, like which is beyond this curve here and the Southern Hemisphere beyond, uh, below this curve here, whereas like the galaxy would be along this line here. So that in galactic coordinates, it reads a little bit strange, but as you will see later, I mean, we will see, uh, in fact, like a discovery plot of a galactic neutrinos, which is exactly like a slab, which is like cut out here. Okay, so if you talk about, I actually put this slide in later because I thought, okay, if you talk about like uh, astrophysical neutrinos, I can probably not escape totally from discussing backgrounds as well. So one person's friend, like Gabriela's friend, the atmospheric neutrinos, uh, the other person's enemy. So if you want to detect astrophysical neutrinos, um, the main background are actually atmospheric neutrinos and atmospheric muons. So let's consider that again, probably you have seen that already like this morning, perhaps. I don't know, I, I had to prepare the lecture so I couldn't follow it. So <laughs> the, uh, the cosmic rays are interacting in the atmosphere. You will produce like charged and neutral ions that would decay in the usual way. Here you have the decay chains a little bit more refined where you see like also the polarity again of the secondaries. Pion goes to muon and muon neutrino. Muon decays further, it goes into like, in this case, uh, the, the anti-muon to positron electron and muon antineutrino. Fine, so this is like what we know. So if that all happens instantly, we would expect like neutrino fluxes of muon and electron neutrinos in certain flavors. The problem, however, is the muon lifetime. Muons have a lifetime in their rest frame of two times 10 to the minus six seconds. Now you can multiply that with the, the light speed and you will arrive like at a distance of about 600 meters. So that corresponds to 600 meters. And then you have to boost it by the Lorentz factor because you have relativistic time dilation. So that's E over the rest mass of the muon. So if you look at this figure, for instance, where you have like log E of the uh, log energy, 
Um, this would correspond to a Lorentz factor of 10 for the muon, 100, 1000, because the muon has a rest mass of the order of 100 MeV, let's say, okay? So um, you see that, in fact, at this point, they would live about, like, let's say, 6 kilometer, 60 kilometer, 600 kilometer. And, of course, the atmosphere is not, like, that high. So that means, eventually, the muons at higher energies, they will arrive at the surface of the Earth. And that has two consequences. First of all, you have to worry about this in your detector because suddenly you don't have only like muons produced from muon neutrinos inside your detector, but also muons from the atmosphere. And the other one is that the flavor actually, ratio actually changes. So that's like a, basically a computation uh, where you, the electron neutrino flux and the muon neutrino flux of up, uh, atmospheric neutrinos are computed and also compared to measurements as a function of energy. And not like what you would naively expect from this picture. Uh, of course, you would have a little bit more like muon neutrinos than electron neutrinos, but here it's in fact like more like a factor of 10 difference, as you can see here. And the reason is because the muons, they survive and they also interact, like actually they lose energy at the same time while they are like uh, propagating. And if you really are interested in how this is done, this kind of computations, I recommend to look into this book, like where you actually, there's like a, a lot of detailed, uh, like discussion about the transport computations. So what it means is like, just remember like a very simplified cartoon picture at the moment, I tried to simplify it like that here. If you think about yourself as being the ice cube detector, if I talk about like upgoing events, it's events which are coming through the earth. If they are directly coming through the Earth, you remember that in the initial flux, we mostly have muon neutrinos now. After oscillations, like atmospheric neutrino oscillations, you would have muon and electron, uh, muon and tau neutrinos. So this is what I was trying to indicate here. But at the end, I mean, this is like what arrives at the detector. It depends a little bit on the energy because if the energy is high enough, then the oscillations don't take place and so on, but fine. Uh, if you talk about downgoing events, the, the neutrinos are coming like, let's say from above in your detector, but since we are sitting at the South Pole, it's a little bit confusing. So downgoing actually means like the ones which are coming from uh, upstairs, uh, like up, up me, like into my detector. And it's partially muons which are surviving there and muon neutrinos, they cannot have oscillated yet, right? So um, if you think about the backgrounds for the downgoing events, it's like muons and muon neutrinos, for the upgoing events, it's mostly muon neutrinos, in fact. So, so that's the difference. And that also determines a little bit your detection strategy and how you do your analysis for these different uh, event classes. Okay, so what uh, has been done there to use that was like essentially there are two classes of like analysis, if you wanted. One is called like high energy starting events. The other one is like true going muon tracks. The high energy starting event analysis basically uses like a, a part of the detector as a veto. So you, if you, for instance, have atmospheric muons entering your detector, you could say, okay, I'll use the outer layer of my detector as a veto. And if I detect a muon there, okay, I reject the event because it must have been an atmospheric muon. Only if it like starts actually inside my actual fiducial volume, then, you know, like I count it as a, as a muon neutrino. And you can do that, of course, also for the, for the cascades. And you can do it like for all sorts of directions, like for upgoing and downgoing events. So it's sensitive essentially to all flavors and to both hemispheres. Of course, I mean, you cannot go to arbitrarily high energies because the events have to be at least partially contained. So, so that means that limits you in a way. Whereas the through going muon analysis is different, you would be mostly sensitive to muon neutrinos from the Northern hemisphere because there you have the earth as a shield for the uh, muons. And you have a relatively high detection volume because the interaction may also take place outside your detector. You don't care if you see like a, a muon track, let's say, which is coming like uh, uh, um, up, which is up going. Let I have to check this myself again, which is up going, like which is like going through the earth. It cannot have been like a, a muon, okay? So it, you don't really care where the interaction is taking place. It may be also like far outside your detector. Uh, and that gives you like a handle, like a large volume essentially, and also like uh, um, yeah, um, uh, high sensitivity at high energies. The only problem is that for these muon tracks, as it was already like kind of obvious from the from this slide here, you may only get like a lower limit for the neutrino energy because the muon may leave your detector and you don't know what happens there. 
or like it starts outside your detector. So at the end, it's like uh, uh, the, the muon energy or the, the energy cannot be as well measured as in this case. Okay. Okay. So at the end, what you see then normally is these kind of figures. That's one of these examples where you see the spectral index. So the spectral index is these, this index, which this is typically these data are fitted. This is astrophysics neutrino data fitted with the power law spectrum. Power law is something which you can easily see because you have a double log plot here and everything which is a straight line in a double log plot is a power law. And in order to see what the difference to an e to the power of minus two spectrum is, you would plot it here as e squared times the neutrino flux and this kind of like units here. So a flat line here is like e to the power of minus two as a spectrum. And why e to the power of minus two is interesting, we will come back to later, okay? So just remember at the moment, it's all gauged within, well, with respect to the benchmark e to the power of minus two for whatever reason. So here you see the spectral index. And in fact, e to the power of minus two is here. You see it's actually higher than two, meaning that it's softer. Softer means it's like tilting in this direction. Harder would be in the other direction. Harder means like at higher energies, you have more stuff going on. Softer, there's less at high energies. And you see the different types of analysis here. You see, I mean, I, I try to do it like in this cartoon way, but you see also like the through going track analysis here. It's like 9.5 years Northern hemisphere. Or you see like the high energy starting events, 7.5 year full sky, like this one here. And apparently you see slightly different spectral indices between these two, which is also like apparent from this kind of figure. And it's not so clear why. I will give you my personal opinion why a little bit later, but uh, at the end, I mean, there seems to be some kind of discrepancy, which is not really super statistically significant, it seems. There are also like other analysis. I, I don't want to go into the details, but there are like many parallel analysis done on different aspects and with different like, let's say cuts and improvements. And, and you see this kind of like comparisons also here in comparison to and the result of the Antares collaboration, which is kind of consistent, but you see because of the smaller detection volume, it's actually um, less uh, constraining. Uh, if you have any questions, you can also ask me, by the way. So it's not like, you know, so stop me. So it's, I'm just talking about the very basics at the moment. Okay. So of course, it's not only the only interesting stuff which has been observed recently. So we, we also, I mean, we, I mean, I'm not in IceCube, but IceCube have also seen other interesting topologies, not only these like cascades, like simple cascades, um, but also like special events like the, the, the glacial resonance. The glacial resonance is a resonant production of a W boson at a particular neutrino energy of, or electron antineutrino energy of 6.3 PeV. So it only works for electron antineutrinos by this kind of process and at a particular neutrino energy. And it was believed that at least one of these events was seen, but that's a publication in Nature 2021 if you're interested. What's also interesting is that certain like uh, tau neutrino candidates have been seen. So if you think about tau neutrino events, most of the taus are um, actually, um, of course, if you have a tau neutrino interacting, you will produce a tau and the tau then after a while decays, mostly like into hadronic channels, okay? So this is what's illustrated here. You have like a first interaction, the tau is produced, the tau creates like a second cascade. And the distance between these two vertices is about like 50 meters times the energy of the neutrino in PEV. So normally, like if you have like lower energetic neutrinos, you cannot really differentiate these two different cascades apparently. At least this was realized during the analysis. So what they did then is that if you look at certain like photomultipliers like this one here, you would look like for double humps because if you have like these two cascades, maybe you have a chance to separate them like by this kind of like double hump structure as a function of time and then say something on a statistical basis about these kind of like uh, uh, tau neutrino candidates. And in fact, it was believed that at least like one or two or maybe three of these candidates were found. So that was also a publication like in 2020. So that's interesting, at least from the particle physics perspective, it doesn't add very much to statistics. So also, I mean, from, from the theoretical perspective, I have to say there is no big reason to believe that the muon and the tau neutrinos would not be, you know, like an equilibrium. So that's like a different story. Mauricio is an expert uh, for these kind of like uh, questions here. 
Okay, so from time integrated point source searches, there were also quite some interesting results. I show this figure because I think it's illustrative also in connection to the exercises. So here you see a parameter which is delta, which is declination. Declination shows up in the exercise again. So if you don't know what it is, uh, it's a, a first step would be to Google it or think about it, what it actually means. And it relates also to what I introduced before, like uh, and called like downgoing or upgoing events. So here you have the downgoing events and here the upgoing ones. And you see that the downgoing ones are the ones which are coming through the, um, maybe I mixed it up here. So if I go back to this figure, so upgoing would be this one here. So this should be upgoing, right? Yeah, so I just correct, I mean, I will correct it later. So this is actually upgoing and this is downgoing. Upgoing has the higher sensitivity. Upgoing, as you can see here, is where the sensitivity curve is much lower than for the downgoing uh, events, where you have like an e to the power of minus three spectrum in this case assumed, or e to the power of minus two in that case. There are different, like, let's call them sensitivity or discovery potentials. I don't want to enter like the details there. Um, this down and upgoing is, as I said, something one should think about in the exercises again, because it's like a, it relates also to the so called effective area. And there's apparently a sensitivity difference between upgoing and downgoing. This is how I also saw now that it must have been like mixed up. Uh, you see that apparently the ice cube is, is more sensitive for the upgoing events, whereas Antares will be more sensitive like here for the downgoing events and this kind of picture. But what I actually wanted to show is that there's a number of like sources which are emerging here at the discovery limit. So three of these are actually so-called AGN blazers. I will talk about these tomorrow. And one of these is a so-called uh, starburst or active galaxy. Active galaxy is a galaxy where there's a lot going on in the center, let's say, okay? Uh, and this is a particular very well studied active galaxy, a so-called SAFA2 galaxy, a, a radio quiet galaxy, that's like an astronomical term if you want it, and has also like an enhanced starburst activity. And apparently it was seen here already like as an astrophysical neutrino source, as you will see in the next slide, it's now like statistically, statistically outstanding. So that's like the most significant point source detection if you want it, but most of the events, and it's not so clear where the neutrinos would actually um, come from. So this is what I was trying to show with this slide, neutrinos from NGC 1068. So that's like a very recent result of IceCube from 2022, where you see like um, electromagnetic data versus neutrino observations. So here, this is like the neutrino measurement for this source where you see neutrinos up to 10 to the three GeV, like a TeV order of. Um, and compared to the electromagnetic data, that's like gamma ray data and like very high energy gamma ray data. And yes, this is like it very interesting, as I will show in a second, or also like discuss a little bit later, maybe tomorrow, that the neutrino data are actually much, much higher than the gamma ray data. That's not something which is easy to understand or to explain. So that gives us some puzzles already. Um, the, you can also see in comparison to other observations, this is like a, a AGM blazer observation related to a, a famous blazer called TXS 0506 plus 056. I will talk about this tomorrow. So that's like one of the events which was found by a so-called follow-up search. So I, this is a, one of my topics tomorrow. And here you see the diffuse astrophysical neutrino flux again in comparison. So you see that these NGC neutrinos, they are like subleading in a way. So like uh, they're only a fraction of the diffuse uh, astrophysical neutrino flux. They're only like living in a certain energy region, but there was like a significant excess of the order of 80 events like uh, from this particular source. So people believe now that this is like one of the established neutrino sources. So as I said, this kind of feature is interesting. I will come back to. Um, so, yeah, the other very interesting result actually, which is only a few weeks old, I mean, you may have heard about that in the news as well, is the discovery of neutrinos from the galactic plane. Here you see the galactic plane, plane in different wavelength bands, like in the, in the optical wavelength band. So that's like what you actually can see. Optical means like, uh, you know, like something which I can see with telescopes or my, my eyes in principle. Gamma rays would be very high energies like GeV and higher energies. And we can also see the galaxy in gamma rays. So that's very interesting. And if we uh, extrapolate that with a particular scheme you know, to even higher energies, you would expect to see something like this in neutrinos as well. 
Well, that's basically like extrapolated if you want it uh, to higher energies. So this would be the neutrino signal from the galaxy as you would expect it naively. What it actually would look like if you take into account the uncertainty of the directional resolution, which, is, which you can see as a cartoon here. Uh, if you smear that out essentially with this uncertainty, it looks like this here. And this is the signal which was actually seen. So in comparison to like this kind of like expectation. And you see, yeah, well, it probably kind of matches the expectation. So probably one has seen these neutrinos, the significance they give in the paper is 4.5 sigma. I find it interesting also to go back now once again. So here you see again this like so southern sky, northern sky kind of thing in galactic coordinates. So if you go back to like one of the very first figures I've actually shown, like this one here. Um, basically what you see here, this is also galactic coordinates, is you take like this slab here out of that, okay, roughly. I mean, it depends on how far it goes. And this, and here you see also the northern hemisphere, like in this region, the southern hemisphere in that region, and the, then the northern hemisphere again. So this is how these different curves here actually emerge. And you see also the galactic center sort of here already. So if you compare this figure to that figure and you already have some kind of imagination. So these are the curves which between Southern and Northern hemisphere, Northern sky, Southern sky, which I showed before, then you can probably also already with some imagination, maybe get a hint of the signal already in earlier data. But I mean, this is disputed of course, because it's not statistically significant, but uh, yeah. So that's just like, um, yeah, short glimpse of that. There's also one thing which is like very popular in astrophysical neutrino sources, which is so-called stacking limits. So that's the idea is that you look into certain directions of like known sources, let's say gamma ray bursts, which are very energetic sources or AGN lasers, which are also very energetic sources. You look in this direction of known sources and you don't see anything. And you use that somehow to constrain the astrophysical neutrino flux from that sources. And that somehow we will actually discuss how that precisely works in one of the exercises in the last one, okay? So in fact, I mean, in one of the exercises, we will get a rough estimate for, for these kind of like sensitivities already from back of the envelope comp computations within a factor of three or four or so. So what you see here is the li limits like on the diffuse flux. So that's again in units like E squared times the flux. So e, e to the power minus two is flat. And uh, in, in this kind of units, and you see it's like very, very low, these limits compared to the actual neutrino observations, like two orders of magnitude lower. So that means that gamma ray bursts probably don't contribute more than like a percent or so of the astrophysical neutrino flux. Um, Annika is going to talk more about gamma ray bursts actually on Wednesday, I think. The same has been done for AGN lasers. So this is like a particular active galactic nuclei where you would actually look into the chat I will talk about tomorrow. Their contribution to the astrophysical neutrino flux is probably also not 100%, but let's say less than 20%. So that also has been discussed in the past. And if you follow archive like uh, and read it like every day, there was also like papers now and then discussing that. I think there was a paper last week like doing that based on a particular catalog search again. So this is like interesting. Um, as I said, we will talk about this a little bit more in the exercises, how that works and, and, and what it means. Now, this is like just a, a cartoon of trying to make sense out of these different data sets and, and what, we, what I think looks like. And uh, in order to do that, it's useful to look at the events like on an event by event basis, okay? So if you picture like you have a list of ice cube events with certain like energies of these events, you can try to deconvolve the energies again. And if you have a model for different contributions of the neutrino flux, you can also say something about uh, what event comes probably from what kind of like a uh, source class. And to do that, I mean, here we introduced like four different like uh, contributions. You have to have like certain atmospheric backgrounds, like I call them residual atmospheric backgrounds. So that's atmospheric muons and muon neutrinos passing the veto systems. There could be a galactic contribution at that time there could be, in fact, now there is. I mean, this is the actual measurement compared to the assumption from 2018. So you see it's like it's consistent within a factor of two. Um, probably it's a little bit lower than anticipated there. So because uh, there's also like gamma ray constraints nowadays and other uh, um, like constraints. 
I think that probably we will also have at the highest energies a contribution, which is kind of peaky. I will come back to that a little bit later in the theoretical part or maybe tomorrow, uh, why we believe that there are these kind of like peaky neutrino contributions at the highest energies, but there must be something which also powers the lower energies. So this is called like XPP here, which could be from starburst galaxies, for instance, with a sort of like e to the power of minus two spectrum. I will come back to that also a little bit later. But if you do that and then you plot it against your deconvolved data, you see that this would be like a hazy tracks in, in black here and uh, the through going muons in purple. You can actually describe your data very well, like in a spectral way. And you can also like assign colors to individual events. And here I'm just doing an animation to show you that this is not unique, this assignment, because for each event, you have certain probabilities that it was like a residual background, a galactic neutrino or whatever. And if I play that again, you see that some of these have a high probability, like let's say to be of galactic origin, like where you have the galactic center here. Some of these have a high probability to be of atmospheric origin, but some of these are changing. Okay. And if you relate these to actually lists of events, you can also like go like, for instance, to high energy starting cascades, tracks, or through going muons, where you have the deposited energy here. Then you can assign or like computer probabilities for being, or let's say, of atmospheric origin, of galactic origin, or of these different astrophysical contributions. And you see, and you can try to get some conclusions about different data sets. And what you see is that in the in the hazy cascades, the atmospheric background are dominant, but there could be like the galactic component hiding. And the reason is that these are sensitive to relatively like low energies, and they're sensitive to um, the um, uh, the, the, the muon flavor and the electron flavor. And uh, if you go back to the, to the atmospheric backgrounds, we saw that the electron neutrinos were suppressed. So it's, it's actually, um, I don't know how the argument goes. Now I'm a little bit confused. Okay. <laughs> so um, for, the, for the, maybe one second. So for the three going muons, on the other hand, which are sensitive to the highest energies, you see that these are actually the good indicators for the astrophysical signals. So the, many of them have a high probability of being of astrophysical origin. It's, it's mostly like energy, which is driving that, of course. So they're sensitive to higher energy. So this is where you want to look for your astrophysical contributions. At the end, you can see that you would look for like the galactic contributions in the hazy cascades sample. And this has been done, in fact, in this galactic analysis. So they were improving on the sensitivity and the hazel sample uh, by, let's say, help of artificial intelligence and so on to actually work out this galactic contribution, which is hiding there. And, and this may be excess of uh, success of this particular um, uh, analysis. Oh, yeah, the thing is that, of course, it's hazy cascades because in the atmospheric neutrino flux, you have like, a, an, if you look at the, the um, yeah, um, bound going events, I mean, the, the galactic plane is in the south. So it's down going events. And in the atmospheric neutrino flux, you don't have um, electron neutrinos then. So you, you would like to look for electron neutrinos, right? And this is like why you have the cascades also. And by there, you have the relatively low backgrounds from the muon neutrino. So that was like the two main reasons why you would actually find this galactic contribution, because you have the lower backgrounds and you actually improved on the, on the analysis by this uh, artificial intelligence um, vetoes, if you wanted. So that's at least my way to understand it as a theorist, if it's, yeah. So the cascade analysis you are referring to is the yeah. Okay. So thanks. So at the end, I think that's just like a, in a way, like a theorist view on like why it could have make sense or why, why there is also like different probably like contributions contributing to the signal and why you have like this discrepancies in the spectra because if you go to these pictures I mean depending on different data sets you're looking at you will have different contributions which are dominating there so so that means at the end um, you would expect um, like uh, different like astrophysical contributions like uh, uh, sticking out in these different samples so that's my view at least on, on this 
Uh, of course, I mean, in the in the future, we don't only want to stick like to like one neutrino observatory. There's not only like plans to upgrade IceCube. There's also other experiments, but uh, the the most prom prominent one here is probably is IceCube Gen Two. So that's the the idea is to actually increase the detection volume of the IceCube detector, which you see here compared to the original volume, plus to add like a surface uh, radio array and, and a veto system here on the surface so it will be a huge experiment and that of course will increase the statistics and also like get sh shed light on these kind of like questions like will there be like separate contributions sticking out i think there are also ongoing analysis on that uh, but at the end i mean high statistics has to come from an experiment like that but that's not the only one also like in seawater there are plans to build the so-called km3 net experiment or there are like other alternatives like the pacific ocean neutrino explorer like close to the coast of Canada. Um, and there's also other ongoing experiments like the Baikal experiment, like on the Lake Baikal in Siberia, where you have like very deep, uh, very clean water. So this is like the future of neutrino astronomy if you wanted uh, to actually learn something more about these contributions. So as a next step, I would go uh, probably a little bit more like in a, in a theoretical picture. So if there are any questions up to now, I mean, maybe it's a good, yeah, the two at least you were first around this. Yeah, so you said you you use certain uh, machine learning models to differentiate between these so uh, bet between these different like categories of uh, events that you see. But um, so how do you deal with the uh, sort of outlier events, right? Because uh, if, if you want to make a model, you have to tell it how many category categories to expect. Um, so, I mean, yeah, so I guess this is, uh, this is more like, like exactly so more, just to explain. Marcus is a member of the IceCube collaboration, so yeah. he has the insight and in all these questions. Yeah. I'm a theorist, which like I'm not a member of the collaboration, so maybe it's better. Yeah, if you yeah so, um, so you basically, it all depends how good your simulation is. Yeah. So, so your simulation is basically supposed to also to capture these outlier events. And then knowing what kind of events are responsible for your simulation allows you then to basically use these machine learning tools then to apply to the data and then get a prediction of how many of these events are uh, composed of muons in, in your data, how many are uh, neutrino events, which are producing cascade like events in the detector. And uh, so these outliers are supposed to be then implemented in the simulation as, as well. Yeah. Or... Yes. Yeah. yeah. There was one more question in the background somewhere. Yeah. Like in the very last row. Hi. Uh, thanks for the really nice talk. I just have a quite a knife question about this sky map that you showed on slide seventeen. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, the the sky map that you showed on slide slide seventeen. Um, yeah, um, I mean, from what I can look here, I, I, I can see that there are many more events in the southern hemisphere, right, than in the northern hemisphere, is it correct? Yeah. I mean, and, and my, my question is just that the southern hemisphere events are downgoing events, right? And so, because I would, naively, I would expect um, a purer neutrino sample uh, from the upgoing events, so I would expect more number of um, uh, sources to be present in the northern hemisphere, right? So this was, I mean, it depends um, on the sample you're looking at. I mean, here in the Northern hemisphere, you have like the problem of uh, earth attenuation. So if you have to go to very high energies, like beyond let's say 10 GeV, and you have like an event which is like upgoing, then it has to penetrate the earth and the earth, or even though neutrinos hardly interact, the cross-section increases with energy. So at some point you have like uh, attenuation effects. And this is why you have like this attenuation here. So if you, if you remove that, it would be more like as a tropic. Right. But it also depends on the event sample because the, for instance, the muon tracks, I mean, are especially affected by that um, and, and where you actually look at. But I think if you, this is the main effect, which actually makes it like anisotropic here in this field. Uh, okay, okay, that's good. Thanks, thanks. Okay, so I would say we better continue at this point a little bit yeah. and then, yeah. So a little bit about the background of this kind of stuff, you know, like how you actually produce neutrinos. So, if we want to like produce neutrinos at the first place, we have to start with particle acceleration. And it's uh, illustrative to actually compare particle acceleration, let's say between the LHC here and an astrophysical source. 
In the LHC, you reach maximal energies of 70 EV it's because you collide protons with 70 EV and 70 EV. The magnetic field is about eight Tesla and the, 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 the radius of this circle is 4.3 kilometers, okay? In the astrophysical sources, we actually don't have as high magnetic fields as you may think. If you look at the numbers in Gauss, but if you convert this in Tesla, it's, it's kind of comparable, but the maximal energies we observe are much, much higher, up to like 300 million TeV. And the reason is that these sources are much, much larger. How large exactly is a bit disputed because it depends on which kind of frame you're sitting in. Are you looking at, if you have something which is relativistically like boosted, are you sitting in the co-moving frame or in the observer's frame or so? But at the end, I mean, the source has to be much larger. So the question is, which mechanisms actually do accelerate the sources to these extreme energies? And one example is a Fermi shock acceleration. And that is like you have a proton which is passing a shock wave. Um, a shock wave is like a discontinuity, let's say, in your plasma properties. And uh, it's, there are certain like random magnetic fields close to the shock wave. And this proton like is going like in a kind of like random fashion around there, if you picture it like that with the magnetic field. And in each of these like circles, it's getting like a kick in energy, okay? But in each of these circles, it would also have a certain probability to drop out of the system because it's random magnetic fields. So if you take that together, you end up in a very simple computation with the so-called like power law spectrum. Do we have a problem or? Oh yeah, okay. So this is like, this balance between, you know, like escape and uh, energy gain per cycle, which manifests itself into this power law spectrum. It simply means that uh, a few particles will be accelerated to very high energies and most particles will stay at low energies. And if you go into more details uh, than like the compression ratio of a shock and so on, you find that e to the power of minus two is the typical spectrum you would expect for these kind of like protons at the first place. So that should ring a bell because I mean, we, we always were talking about e to the power of minus two all the time. So we multiply this vector with e squared. So in order to see if it's flat. Um, I don't want to go into greater details there, but uh, I was promised by Enrico that he would uh, like uh, show you a little bit more details in his talk tomorrow on that, okay? So the theory of acceleration is apparently challenging, um, but we do observe this kind of like power law spectra actually in nature. So that's a spectrum of like uh, ultra, of cosmic rays. And it's not only ultra energy cosmic rays, it's cosmic rays over many, many orders of magnitude and energy. And you see here a double lock plot again, and you see like straight lines in this double lock plot. And straight lines in a double lock plot again mean that it has to be a power law spectrum. So we do know that these kind of like mechanisms exist. If they really have like e to the power of minus two spectra or not, we don't really well precisely understand yet. I mean, there are like people who say there are small corrections to that. Others say, I mean, there are bigger corrections. There's also like some other issues. For instance, we don't really fully understand how the cosmic rays escape from the sources and so on. Uh, but at the end, I mean, we, we know that there must be this kind of like very powerful accelerators up to this very high energies, which are following this kind of like logic, like produce power law spectra. And that's also the motivation for like experiments like uh, astrophysical neutrino experiments to look for like power law spectra. So this is why this e to the power of minus two is like the zero order paradigm. There's a little bit more to that. I will come back to later, but uh, that's the zero order approximation. Now, then if you want to produce like neutrinos, you have like a beam, let's say of protons or nuclei, and you would hit a target. That's the typical cartoon picture of protons, photons, or nuclei. If you'd have that, you can in particle physics relatively easily compute the interaction rate. The interaction rate, if you look at the units, is also coming out right. It's just like the number density of your target, whatever ions, uh, times the cross section or photons times the cross section. The cross section, let's assume it's known. So this is, for instance, one of these cross sections is the cross section for P gamma interaction as a function of, let's call it center of mass energy. Here it's a little bit different quantity. It's the photon energy in the nucleon rest frame, but it's like a one-to-one -one correspondent uh, thing to the center of mass energy. And you see the famous so-called delta resonance here, but also higher resonances and the like uh, so-called multi-pion processes, which are giving you a flat cross-section at high energies. So that will play a role a little bit later. 
So at the end, this is like the most simplest form, which is typically the usual propaganda, you know, like material for neutrino production. The truth is it's a little bit more complicated because in these kind of interactions, we not only produce like charge pions, but for instance, also neutral pions. The neutral pions will decay into photons again. And then you immediately have the problem that for instance, the photons would add to your target. So you actually modify your target while you're producing like the secondaries. And this is why in astrophysics, we use a little bit different picture. So this red target here corresponds to something we call radiation zone. This radiation zone is described in terms of the densities of the particles inside, which I call like N, like the density of protons and photons in certain units. And we inject particles into this radiation zone and there are neutrinos and other particles coming out of this radiation zone. And this whole thing is called like radiation model. Okay, now this is like how it, this is normally done. How it's done in a little bit more theoretical way is you would solve in this radiation zone for each of the species, like the proton, the photon, the pion, the muon, the neutrino, and so on, one differential equation, like a partial differential equation, which describes the time evolution of the species here. N has also units here. I gave it units per GeV and cubic centimeter. So it's actually a density uh, differential in energy. And then there, you attach certain terms to that species. So the species, for instance, could be cooling. So that would be like for an electron, the most favorite cooling process is synchrotron cooling. A proton may be also cooling by photohadronic interactions because it produces like pions. Uh, these species could also escape like from your zone, like by trivial escape, like just like escaping out there or going out there or diffusion or whatever. But they could also like, let's say decay for instance and other species, which would be also a decay process, uh, escape process because it modifies the differential equation for that species. And there could be injection into your species. And this injection could be actually injection from a radiation so from an acceleration zone. So if you have like particles accelerated somewhere, they could be injected or there could be injection from other species. Like let's say the muon gets injection from the pion decay, okay? And this is typically expressed if there are interactions by these kind of like integrals, so that you would integrate over the density of the other species times its interaction rate or decay rate, whatever you have there, times a redistribution function, which describes how these primaries are distributed in the secondary particle in, in terms of like the energy distribution. So you are familiar with that, perhaps in like in very simple context. So a very simple approximation, for instance, is that the neutrino would get a certain fraction of the pion energy because the pion decays like into a muon and the muon decays further. So at the end, the pion decays like in an electron and three neutrinos. So in four particles and four leptons. So the easiest approximation is the neutrino per flavor takes one fourth of the pion energy. And the pion, in fact, in each interaction takes about 20% of the proton energy typically. So we know that the neutrino takes about 20% uh, times 0.25, so it's like 5% of the initial proton energy. So that would just correspond to a relatively narrow such redistribution function so that the neutrino gets a certain fraction of the proton energy, for instance, or the pion takes a certain fraction of the proton energy if you look at the pion species. So that's not something which is unfamiliar, but in reality, these are like energy distributions. So these radiation processes, I mean, we have seen many of them. So this is like part of the problem in theory. So one thing is you solve these partial differential equations for all the different species. The other is of course that you have to describe all these radiation processes properly. So a lot of work goes actually like in modeling these. And we have seen many of these, for instance, we have seen the photopion production. So you would produce pi pluses, which decay in the usual way into muons and then neutrinos. Here, they actually let the neutron, which is also produced there, decay outside the source probably into a proton by typical neutron decays. You have like uh, pi zeros produced, which would decay, but you also have like for protons, other processes, like you could have synchrotron radiation or so-called beta hydra pair production, electron positron pair production. And for the electrons, the most famous ones are of course synchrotron radiation, which most of the cases dominates. And as we will see tomorrow, also inverse Compton scattering. So that's like uh, upscattering like photons with a high energetic electron to higher energies. So there are many of these processes. And of course, sim similar for muons and pions. So you have to think about and worry about the relevant ones and implement them in this kind of like uh, context. 
So um, let maybe like a little bit further. So we have um, then let's take a look at the neutrino spectra again in this context. So how do the typical neutrino spectra look like and why do they look like that? So a typical, let's say, spectrum from P gamma interaction does actually not look like an e to the power of minus two spectrum. So what you rather see is like peaky spectra, as I indicated already earlier. And because of this property, which I mentioned here, the neutrinos take about 5% of the proton energy. If you have a cutoff in the proton energy at a certain energy, the cutoff in the neutrino energy will be also at 5% times the proton energy cutoff. And this is what you typically see in this spectra. There's a cutoff, which is driven by the maximal proton energy at some point here, okay? This is where the spectrum goes away. What happens below this like peak here depends for P gamma interactions on the target photons actually. So the, the spectral shape here carries the spectral index of the initial protons like e to the power of minus two and the target photons. And only if it, like it's the uh, beta is actually one, then you would carry the e to the power of minus two spectrum in this case. So um, yeah. Now it's also interesting to see what kind of like secondaries you are like interacting with. So if you interact, for instance, in this kind of process, which is the famous delta resonance process, your proton would interact with the target photon, produce a delta plus resonance, where you produce like a neutron plus uh, pi pluses or a proton plus pi zeros in certain ranging ratios. This one goes to the neutrino, this one goes to gamma rays. The question is, what's the relevant target photon energy? And for that, you can go like to either like this cross section figures I showed you before, like this one here, or you go to like a, a convoluted version already, like this one here, where you see the cross section times multiplicity. Multiplicity means like how many pions do I actually produce in each process as a function of a quantity, which is like, let's say, center of mass energy. It's the proton energy times the photon energy over the proton mass. And if you have the proton energy, which is 20 times the neutrino energy plugged in there and the target photon energy, and you look what value I have at the peak, LR stands for a lower resonance or the delta resonance, I can take this value and plug it in there and can relate it to the neutrino energy. And I see that the relevant target photon energy would be in the KeV range, let's say like 10 EV to KeV, depending on the boost factor of the source. So that's another complication because we typically compute these interactions in the frame um, where the uh, photons are isotropic or in the co-moving frame. So, but at the end, I mean, you see what the target photon energies are, which are interesting for us. If the source is not Lorentz boosted, we have like 10 EV for a PEV neutrino, if it's highly Lorentz boosted, it could be like whatever KeV or for GRBs, even MeV in the observer's frame. So that's observer's frame energies here. So that means KeV energies in electromagnetic observations are in principle interesting for us because they will tell us about the targets for the neutrino production. You can also see from this figure that uh, sometimes, I mean, people are using whatever, like a threshold for the, for the delta resonance only, which is like this point here. Um, so this actually includes the so-called pitch angle averaging. That means the angle between the proton and the target photon, which is also relevant here. Sometimes people ignore that like multi-pion processes are relevant for like pi plus production or pi minus production. So you can take whatever point you wanted. You can take this one here, you can take that one here, or you can take the threshold and you will get totally different answers by a factor of five here. But it's like every, everything like that you will find in the literature. I mean, even in my own papers, you will find all sorts of different versions here. So it's uh, like for analytical estimates, probably good enough. But if you talk about numerics, I mean, you have to be aware that like the pitch angle matters and also different processes matter. Then it's also interesting to look in the multi-messenger context actually on the other photons, like these ones here, the photons which are produced together with the neutrinos. So they will decay into, uh, these pi zeros will decay into two gamma rays with a very high branching ratio. And these gamma rays are injected similar, with similar arguments as the neutrinos at about 10% of the maximal proton energy. So they will have a similar spectrum as that one here, but a little bit shifted. And this is very, very high energies actually for a gamma ray. Typically gamma rays, I mean, at that high energies, they're doing a lot of like dirty stuff inside the source already, okay? And uh, just with my final slide, maybe for today, because we are running out of time. I mean, Marcus was working on that like a couple of years ago. So here you see as an argument, something which is called optical thickness, a concept. 
which is like basically the size of the region over the mean free part. So if the mean free part of the particle is comparable to the size of the region, the optical thickness is one. If it's much shorter, the optical thickness is like much larger than one. So that means the particle would interact several times over the size of the region or like over the escape time of the particle. Um, if it's much smaller, it would hardly interact. And here they realized that uh, basically um, the neutrino and the photon photon interactions are related. So if you have like efficient neutrino production at the highest energies, it means that you have even more efficient like gamma gamma interactions at GeV energies where you would have your like gamma ray experiments. So here the optical thickness, for instance, for the neutrinos is like of the order of like 10 to the minus two. This FP gamma is related to the optical thickness. It's defined in a little bit different way, but at the end, uh, the neutrino production is not too efficient, but here the optical thickness for gamma gamma interactions, on the other hand, like the gamma rays interacting with the gamma rays in the source or the, the target photons in the source is very, very high in comparison at, low, at lower energies here. So that means these gamma rays, which are produced like by these interactions, they cannot escape from the source. And this is why a lot of people nowadays speculate that perhaps the efficient neutrino emitters are not so efficient gamma ray emitters because you would have uh, the suppression of gamma rays. We will see tomorrow that the picture is a little bit more complicated. It's also more complicated from what you can see here already. I mean, one thing which is very often neglected is that these uh, processes also be those electrons and positrons and these electrons and positrons that would produce other things like synchrotron radiation and thus quantum scattering. And again, this would like annihilate the photo photon pair production. So you have to take into account all these different things in something which is called like electromagnetic cascade in the source. And with that, I want to finish today. I just want to go, go back to the slide maybe at this point, just to remind you again, if you talk about like peak gamma interactions, we don't have like e to the power of minus two neutrino spectra. We have something which depends on the target photons. We do have like something which follows the maximal proton energy normally. We will see tomorrow that there are some exceptions. And we are interested in the photon connection, like the multi messenger connection in the KEV range, because this is our targets, which we produce the neutrinos from, and also in the TEV to PEV range, because this is like, let's say, the, the products of the interactions. Uh, which are the signatures, the co-signatures of the neutrino production, which are, are however, typically also already suppressed in the source or at least modified. Thank you for the moment. We have uh, more time this afternoon, uh, this evening, actually, for, for general questions on, on, the, uh, on the lecture. But are there any questions right now? Yes. Sick. Thank you. Um, so I don't know if there's an answer to the question I'm going to ask, but um, so I guess the ultimate goal would be to predict a neutrino flux based on the gamma ray flux or oppositely. So you mentioned this optical thickness measurement. Is there any other avenues or, or things that we're trying I mean, to what do? You are do uh, mentioning, mentioning is actually a pretty good point. I didn't get that far today, but I will show one example for this relationship uh, tomorrow or so. So like, in fact, you can relate the neutrino and the gamma ray fluxes in certain cases. Um, but you have to assume, of course, that it's kind of like unmodified uh, leaving the source, right? Okay, so that's the argument I wanted to make. So for these high intensity sources, I'm going to discuss or start tomorrow, maybe like AGN, for instance you would expect there are some effects inside the source. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. No. Hi, uh, thank you for, for the lecture. Um, so I was wondering about the shape of this uh, P gamma spectrum. You mentioned that the high energy cutoff is, is based on basically the acceleration capabilities of the source is based on how energetic the proton can get. The low energy part, is that like a threshold effect yeah. because of the delta production? Or? Yeah, this, this is in principle like this kind of like uh, uh, kink here, if you want that it's like a threshold effect, typically either because of the P-gamma threshold or like, uh, yeah, it's the, the P-gamma threshold essentially. Okay. Because also even if the target photons have like a lower energy cutoff also it, it translates somehow into the P-gamma threshold. 
but I will go into these details, uh, not details. I will add something more to that uh, also tomorrow because it's not the complete truth yet. I just was not able to cover it today. So okay. like for <laughs> P-gamma interactions, let's just keep that in mind, but there are some exceptions to that picture. All right, thank you. So I had actually a question there. The, uh, this this uh, small inset plot there. Uh, so that is the cross section. That's the cross section, the pitch angle average cross section. That means like you assume as a, as a tropic pitch, pitch angle distribution between the proton and the photon. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, times the multiplicity of the pions. Mm -hmm. And you see okay. that uh, the, the lower, the delta resonance is something which actually in this case doesn't dominate. In mm -hmm. fact, you could also like forget about that. So I think the reason why people believe that the data resonance would dominate is if you do the same figure, which is also in the paper here, uh, if you do the same figure for like the pi zero production, it is actually the data resonance, which is dominating. But for the neutrino production, it's not. Yeah, okay, thanks. So, yeah. Any other questions? I should maybe also ask if there are questions on Zoom. I don't see any. Okay, then I suggest let's uh, thank Walter again and also Gabriela for this morning.